when I first meet someone new and we're doing the who are you, where do you come from, what do you do, small talk, people typically ask me two things. Right after asking if I know their friend Bruce who grew up in Sydney, <laughs> And after learning that I work on memory, people often ask me how they can make their memory better. Now, when we talk about memory, we typically think of two things. We think of how good or bad we are at remembering information or to put spit out back on a test. And we think about how good we are at remembering the items on the grocery list or that thing that I just went upstairs to get and I just can't remember what it was. We also think about the conscious recollection of people, places, and events from our past that we often remember as visual scenes. And many of us can remember these from early in childhood. One of my early memories is going to get a kitten. I'd been bugging my parents for a really long time, and I was so excited we were going to do it. I was all of three, maybe four. I went with my father, and maybe my brother was there, and we went to a house, and I got to choose a fluffy, mostly black tortoiseshell kitten. And when he got in the car, and my father handed me this fluff ball, I was suddenly terrified of her claws. We all have a lot of other types of memory, too. Learning how to navigate around our town or the building we work in is really important for being able to function in everyday lives. And who's heard of Pavlov's dogs? They learned, <laughs> I like all the hands there. <laughs> they learned that a bell predicted food. And they might not have been thinking, okay, bell means food, but they showed behaviors, drooling, probably jumping up and down, suggesting that they knew the food was coming. Now, we all have this type of memory too. We might not think, oh, food, when we see this symbol, or coffee, when we see these, but when we see them, we're more likely to stop to get fries when we're on a road trip, or coffee on our way to work. We might not think too much about this symbol, but for many of you in the audience, and my toddler, will often think or say, go blue, when it pops up on the screen. <laughs> Memories are important for driving our behavior based on what we've learned in the past and what we've experienced in the past. And when I say we, I mean humans, but I also mean primates, other vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles, invertebrates, insects, and probably bacteria too. When we study memory, we're interested in how memory is formed in the brain and how forgetting works. And we also want to know what happens when memory goes wrong in disorders of memory and how can we fix it. And we also want to know how does memory allow us to function in the world. Memory is a fundamental process of the brain. So before we talk more about memory, we need to talk a little bit about the brain. The brain is amazing. It's this mass of interconnected cells held together by sugar and fat. It jiggles. It's electric, sending pulses of electricity that cause release of chemicals. And I know you've all seen those direct-to-consumer ads that show that. Those chemicals activate and suppress other neurons, and those in turn help control our behavior. And all of that's pretty cool. But even more amazing is that the brain cells, unlike other cells in our body, change with experience. They increase and decrease these bumpy-looking nodules, each one of which is a connection with another neuron. As they change connections, they change the circuits and networks in our brain, which means that when we next retrieve that memory, our behavior and thoughts are now different from what they would have been before. So who's heard that something changes the brain, usually as a dial warning? TV changes your brain. Drugs change your brain. Internet, smartphones, definitely changing your brain. Even space can change your brain. All of these statements are true. They're all correct. But it's not some terrible thing. It's not leading down the path to destruction. It's not specific to TV or drugs or space. It's a feature, not a bug, of how the brain stores memory and changes with new information. For example, for all of you in the audience, and for all of us on stage, this is the first time we've had this specific experience. Next time you walk by the power center, 
you're going to activate that specific pattern of connections in your brain that you formed tonight to retrieve the memory of tonight. Congratulations, everybody. We have changed your brain tonight. <laughs> now, remembering this evening might not seem like that big a deal. It's just one night in the grand scheme of things. But perhaps one of these talks is going to change how you think about a problem or a concept. Maybe it's going to cause you to change your course of study or change your career path. For animals and us, when we experience something really good, and for most animals, that's high-calorie, delicious food, for tonight, it might be a really good talk. We can want to keep coming back to the same place, seeking out the same kinds of experiences in the hopes of more. But if something really terrible happens, an earthquake may be, we would remember that event very strongly, and all of us would probably feel anxious coming back into another darkened auditorium. This is a huge change in behavior, and it's really, really adaptive. If you experience something dangerous in the world, you should avoid that in future in order to stay safe. So memory is fundamental for driving our behavior and changing our behavior to keep us safe and allow us to function in the world. Because of this, because memory is so fundamental for how we can function, disorders of memory are particularly problematic. I'm sure all of you have heard of Alzheimer's disease. This is a disorder primarily of memory loss. And as the population ages, it's becoming more and more common. High profile, recent high profile examples include President Reagan and the country singer uh, Glenn Campbell, who had, who had his own documentary about his disease. It's even depicted in movies, small ones like The Notebook. One of the early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is commonly getting lost in familiar places. The inability to find one's way home again from the store, somewhere you, where you've been thousands of time, or find your way to work. This is incredibly distressing and incredibly difficult to continue functioning ind independently with this kind of memory loss. Now, it's fairly easy to understand why memory loss might disrupt our everyday lives. It's less obvious that overly strong memories are also problematic. Let's think back to that example of what if an earthquake happened tonight. All of us would remember that event and we would have a good amount of fear and anxiety if we came back into a similar place. But maybe 20% of us would also develop post-traumatic stress disorder. In post-traumatic stress disorder, people have retrieval of that memory very, very vividly. There's extremely strong fear responses, panicky, jumpy, heart racing, but really, really intensely. People wouldn't, with post-traumatic stress disorder wouldn't just remember this when they saw the power center or went into a darkened auditorium. This memory would be triggered in places similar and places really, really different from this as well. When that happens, people want to avoid that panicky feeling and start to avoid going places in their life, even if they have nothing to do with the original memory. In this way, these overly strong memories in post-traumatic stress disorder are incredibly disruptive to everyday life. So if memory, if, if Alzheimer's disease is a loss of memory and post-traumatic stress disorder is too strong, strong of a memory, can we treat this? Can we go in and manipulate these memories? Can we make memory stronger in people with Alzheimer's disease than for those of us without problems with memory? Maybe, maybe. There's legitimate and important research continuing aiming to strengthen memory and cognitive function in people with Alzheimer's disease and in the normal population, which is a really lucrative career avenue if it works out. And there's legitimate work aiming to erase memory or at least decrease the strength of memories in post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that I've said that out loud, erasing memory, who's feeling a little mm, icky about the idea of going in and zapping memories, or even selectively strengthening memories? It's all a little total recall. Although the fact that those movies exist in remakes tells us something about how much we think about these possibilities. 
And yet, even with this ethical ickiness in mind, I'm going to put money on the fact that many of us in the room would be still pretty happy to try out some memory-enhancing drugs. And in that case, I have some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is that I can tell you how to enhance your memory, and it's free. Add emotion, just not too much. Every single one of us remembers memories with emotion better than those without. It's why we remember where we were when we heard about a traumatic event. For some of us, might have, some of us that might have been 9-11. And why do I remember that particularly, particular memory of the kitten and not any of the hundreds of days afterwards I, hit, I played with her or the days before when I was bothering my parents to get a kitten? Emotion. I was so excited and so then so scared. The instructions for this TED talk include, make us laugh, make us cry. It's not just because it feels good, it's because you're going to remember the talks better that way. You'll talk about them more, and we will have more impact. Congratulations, we've changed your brain tonight. The bad news is, there's always a catch, the bad news is that this advice is probably less than helpful. It's hard to get just that excited about information on a test or scared about the toilet paper on the shopping list. And I still <laughs> don't remember what I went upstairs to get. But this limitation of memory, this forgetting is a feature, not a bug. Imagine for a second if you could remember everything you did and where you were and who you were with and when it happened. And there are people who do. How would this make your life better? How would it change your behavior? Most importantly, how would it change your relationships? Perhaps instead of thinking about memory as a vault where items get placed in and removed as needed, a concept of memory that makes us all sound a little like robots, maybe we should think about memory as a flexible and functional map of the world that integrates our physical space, our cognitive space, our emotional space, and everything that we've learned before. As we move through this map made of our memories, we find links that allow us to travel across space and time and context. Perhaps in the course of this talk, you've remembered some long ago fact that you read somewhere about the brain. Or maybe you've thought of your own childhood pet. When information becomes less important, it doesn't go away, it just becomes less closely integrated at all of those points, leaving it to be less easily accessible. It's not gone, it's still there somewhere, you just can't access it. And when we learn information, that gets integrated at all of the new points. If you use a memory a lot, it's going to get integrated throughout that map at, very, at, at a lot of different key points. This analogy allows us to think about why disorders of memory are so brutal. Overly strong memories become integrated at key points where they shouldn't be. Wherever you are in your map, you're going to access that memory and retrieve it, and it's going to interfere and intrude in your everyday life. In disorders of memory loss, it's not just a file-by-file -file deletion of things you once knew, it's a stripping back of layers of information until you don't understand where the person in front of you fits within your life, breaking down your world to absolute zero. This analogy also lets us revisit that original question. How can I make my memory better? Perhaps, if we think about memory not as information to be spat out on the map or the grocery list to remember, spat out on, the, on an exam or the grocery list to be, to be remembered, but instead as this uh, map that allows us to have conversations, find our way around the, work, around the world, find food, stay safe, and generally function, what is there to improve? 